eventually fall asleep if you want that one. Yeah, because one of the problems these days is everybody puts computers on the podium. And if you have a text, you can press the click. Okay, Molly, watch this show. We're live. <laughs> Am I live? Yes, you yeah, are. Even Mike. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to everybody, whether you're in suits and ties today or just T-shirts. Um, I'm Richard Boucher. I'm the Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence here at the Ford School. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I want to acknowledge the, the hard work and excellent preparations of uh, Professor Al Stam, Director of the Ford School's International Policy Center, and Thea Rowe for her work in planning the event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, you all know me here. I'm trying to masquerade as a professor, but the, my first admission is that I'm one of these guys. Uh, I'm a career diplomat who's turned into a teacher trying to turn into a teacher. They've done it successfully already. But let me introduce him. Uh, Mel Levitsky, many of you know. He's a Michigan grad who became a senior leader in the US Foreign Service. He was executive secretary of the State Department, running all of his little guys down below. Uh, he was US ambassador in Bulgaria and Brazil. And he was a head of what we affectionately called Drugs and Thugs, which is the Bureau for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, which comes with its own small Air Force. <laughs> uh, now he's in his second career, uh, translating all that experience into knowledge for you here at the Ford School, as he's done previously in Syracuse. So Mel is with us here all the time, and uh, I'm proud to be among his colleagues again. John Negroponte, our main guest today, is one of America's most accomplished diplomats. He served 37 years in the Foreign Service, uh, including uh, early days in Vietnam before some others of us in college were out demonstrating against the war. Uh, he was confirmed, I think, eight times by the Senate, if I did the math right. Um, and he represented the United States as ambassador in five different countries, in Honduras, Mexico, Philippines, Iraq, and New York uh, at the United Nations. He went on to become Director of National Intelligence and Deputy Secretary of State, making all of his career officials both envious and proud. And now he works in Washington for the McClarty Group, and he teaches at a university in New Haven that has a four-letter name. Uh, John's experience distinguishes him from the rest of us. He's demonstrated leadership over and over again in all these jobs in the service of our country of presidents of both parties and Secretary of States, Secretaries of State of both parties. Now, all of us have served in some difficult and even controversial situation. I'm glad he's here to reflect on that experience. Um, I've worked for both these guys. I look forward to hearing the conversation about leadership between these two most excellent American diplomats. And I'd like to remind all of you in the audience that if you have a question for Ambassador Negroponte or for Ambassador Levitsky, 
Uh, please write it on one of the cards passed out at the entrance. Uh, Ford School volunteers will begin collecting cards at around 5 p.m. and our uh, students, Amanda Van Dorn and Dima Singh, Seema Singh, sorry, you. will read your questions. Uh, if you're watching online, you could submit your question via Twitter and use the hashtag Ford Policy Union. That's all one more. I suppose if you're watching in the audience, you can tweet the question too. Uh, anyway, John Mel, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you. John, thank you. Sit over on that side. Yeah. Thank you. Now let's see if we're are we wired up okay? Hear us? Think so. Yeah, so I have my David Frost clipboard. Hey. Not Nixon. Okay. Okay. So to, to, I, I, today we're going to I have a Nixon. That's okay. I do too. Up to a certain point. Um, here. Today we're going to talk about leadership and foreign policy. One of the things uh, that's important at the Ford School and most uh, schools of public policy is what constitutes good leadership. Uh, certainly important in government, but across the, the board in terms of non-governmental organizations, international organizations, business organizations. So we want to talk about this a little bit, and we'll have a free-flowing uh, conversation, which will, as we talk, we'll get into some uh, subjects that are, have current relevance as well. But you know, John uh, and I have been colleagues for a long time, and he's had such a long, distinguished career. We can't pass up uh, his comments on some of these challenging assignments that he had and give us some insight into the decision-making process, into the leadership that, uh, that went into both that he exerted and how he observed presidents and secretaries of state. Uh, John has known presidents and secretaries of state dating from the Nixon administration. So we'll use that opportunity. So the first thing, John, I'd, I'd like to ask you is a general question. When you think of the concept of leadership, what qualities uh, do you think of? What, what, um, what defines good leadership? What defines good leaders? And thank, by the way, thank you very much for yeah, coming. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. and I. Welcome this opportunity to uh, be interviewed by you, Mel, and to have a, an exchange with, uh, with the audience. Um, what defines good leaders? Some leaders uh, or potential leaders don't ever get that opportunity. In a way, uh, leadership is sort of a baptism by fire, it seems to me. I mean, how would we have ever found out that Lincoln was a good leader if it hadn't been for the Civil War, uh, or Franklin Roosevelt had not been for the advent of the Depression or the Second World War. So it seems to me that history plays a role in all of this. And uh, I suppose to my way of thinking, as I look at American history anyway, and keep that universe of leadership to people from our country, it's uh, people who are able to respond with, uh, with calm, uh, collective, collectively, and with a sense of direction in the face of very adverse circumstances. It seems to me that that would be kind of my shorthand definition of leadership. So what about knowledge? What about ideology or strongly held ideas? Uh, what about flexibility, which is a, a different kind of yeah. uh, quality as well? All right, well, so now you think of presidents and secretaries exactly. of state. Exactly, and I think in a way you get into different categories of position and leadership. I mean, you ask me, uh, is there a difference between, uh, most presidents aren't going to, no matter how much knowledge they have, are probably not going to have uh, enough knowledge to be able to deal uh, with a variety of circumstances that they're going to confront uh, right from the beginning. Take the example of Mr. Obama. He'd been a in the state legislature, and then he barely completed a term mm -hmm. as senator, and uh, then he finds himself as president of the United States. Well, how on earth can you have enough knowledge about 100 and so many countries in the world, the different alliances, the confrontations we face, uh, and so forth? So if you wanted to rate uh, presidents on the basis of uh, 
knowledge of foreign affairs, for example, uh, when they first came into office, I guess you'd have to put at the very top of the list George Herbert Walker Bush, I mean, in modern times, because he'd been uh, director of the CIA, he'd been our representative in Beijing, and he'd been ambassador to the United Nations. I mean, he was almost, from a foreign policy point of view, qualified to be president by competitive exam. Um, but that, of course, that's not the way it happens. So he was extremely knowledgeable, but he also, he surrounded himself with very good people, and he had a very congenial team. And I think it's probably the best foreign policy team that we've had in our government uh, in, in uh, recent memory. I think as you go down the ladder, I think you expect a higher level of expertise. By the time you get down to the level, say, of an ambassador, sure, you have a big embassy. Let's say you're named ambassador to China or to, the, to Russia. You have a big embassy to run, and you obviously have to have uh, a modicum of managerial capabilities. But to my way of thinking, if you're going to go to one of those critical posts, you really ought to have a deep knowledge of the society and the culture and, and hopefully the language of the country to which you're being uh, chosen to represent the United States. So it varies a little bit from the position. I want to, position. I want to interject here a, a recent example of this, which mm -hmm. I think is a really bad example of, of choosing personnel. The recent uh, appointees to go to Argentina and Norway, who right. testified and knew nothing about either country. They, right. were, they were, of course, political appointees, so they had, you know, th that old thing about I can pick up the, the phone and call the president, which is kind of a myth, I think. Usually but, not really true. Usually not really true. Pamela Harriman, as I remember, could do that, mm -hmm. but with no, but no, very few could do that. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think that's a, that's a good point. I want to ask you a, a very specific question, and I, I'm not, I don't mean to be partisan or favorable toward one or the other in any way, but you know, President Carter, for example, had a, uh, a very strong influence on foreign affairs. Human rights became a much more solid part of our foreign policy, and he had Camp David. Um, and uh, President Reagan, uh, did a lot, but he had Iran Contra, and yet, um, and certainly couldn't have been depicted as someone very knowledgeable about foreign affairs when he came in, when he came into office. So why do we con why do why is it generally considered that Reagan was a good leader and Carter was not? What's like, the deal here? Yeah, what's the deal? Well, of course, one of the deals is that I guess we can agree when it comes to politicians at that level, uh, the electorate uh, passes judgment uh, in and of itself. And of course, Mr. Carter was defeated in his bid to uh, mm -hmm. win a second term. I, I would agree with you that he, uh, I think the Camp David Accords were a major accomplishment in American uh, foreign policy. But uh, on the other hand, uh, at the very end of his administration, he was completely unable to cope Iran. with the question of Iran and the seizure of our embassy and the hostage uh, taking of our diplomats uh, in that country, uh, bungled uh, a rescue attempt and kind of left us feeling uh, rather helpless and hopeless at the end of his administration. And you could, those of us who we're old enough to remember that time. Uh, we could see the tide shifting right in front of our eyes, uh, moving from, from Carter uh, to Reagan. Uh, Reagan, uh, first of all, I think he was lucky. Uh, he came out of the Iran-Contra thing, uh, in the end, more or less unscathed. I think also the progression of his term of office was very interesting. And I did work mm -hmm. closely with Reagan. I was his deputy national security advisor for uh, more than a year, so I used to see him uh, every day. But we went from the evil empire, you'll remember mm -hmm. that at the beginning, that's how he characterized the Soviet Union, to then this uh, watershed meeting that he had in December, I think it was, or no, late November of 1985, where, which he had with Mr. Gorbachev near mm -hmm. Geneva. And then all of a sudden, Mr. Gorbachev became his friend. And uh, he proceeded in his second term to establish a much friendlier uh, relationship uh, uh, with the Soviet uh, leadership that led to a major arms control treaty at the end of his administration. And I think that, generally speaking, everybody feels that we were moving um, 
our foreign policy in a very positive direction. And of course, a couple of years later, the Soviet Union actually uh, disintegrated and the Berlin Wall collapsed and so on and so forth. So Reagan, I think, benefits from uh, the evolution of history. He also benefits, let's face it, I remember correctly, after a very difficult economic period at the beginning uh, with high unemployment and high inflation, he benefited from a significantly improved economic uh, situation in, shall we say, the second two-thirds of his uh, government. So I think that was a factor as well. Mm -hmm. I thought he was very serene in the way he dealt with things. And I think that's Confident, the way, yeah. well, he was. We briefed him. He didn't get all panicked. Uh, he didn't always, you know, what are we going to do? You know, I mean, he was always, we always started, I mean, I briefed him. I went in with General Powell. He was the national security. And he always started with uh, about five minutes of jokes. <laughs> and he'd pull them out of his drawer. He, had the late, he loved Polish jokes. He loved Russian <laughs> jokes. Uh, and he told them, and he read them to us. And I mean, he really took them seriously. Um, and then we went on to his uh, briefing. But I never, don't, I never knew him to flap, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet he had very, he had much more intellectual curiosity than he was given credit for. He read Gorbachev's book on perestroika before mm -hmm. he met him. Uh, I once uh, uh, was sort of the moderator at a luncheon that he had with about 20 Soviet scholars, American Soviet mm -hmm. scholars, that we went around the table and he asked questions of each of them for a one and a half hour period. Not sure a lot of Americans gave him credit, credit yeah. for that kind of uh, engagement. Yeah, and well, I think also, since I was in Washington at the time as executive secretary, I think we have to give a lot of credit to Secretary Schultz, too, as a leader in terms of his um, influence and also Nancy Reagan. I think Nancy Reagan had a big, you tell me if you think this is right, had a big effect on Ronnie. She was thinking of his, uh, they had a very close relationship, she was thinking of his historical legacy. And this whole thing with leaving something besides just the evil empire talk I think was important to her and to him. Well, first on, on on Mrs. Reagan, General Powell, when he briefed me on my job uh, as Deputy National Security Advisor, he said, I'll handle Mrs. Reagan. I mean, Mrs. Powell. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I said, OK, <laughs> that's fine by me. Colin. Uh, so I never really had much to do with mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Reagan, except an occasional helicopter ride when I was mm -hmm. accompanying the president somewhere. And she was always perfectly gracious and kind. Uh, I think you're absolutely right about George Schultz. I think he was a wonderful Secretary of State. He was a superb leader of people. And I think mm -hmm. that came from a combination of his, first of all, Marine. He was a former Marine. And I think that really meant a lot to him. He'd fought his way up the Pacific Island chain mm -hmm. uh, during uh, World War II. And uh, he never forgot that part. He was an academic and a great scholar. And uh, this was, in fact, his third cabinet post. He'd been Secretary of Labor and Treasury under Richard Nixon. There's, again, knowledge and experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at a high level. If you, I want to say, if you've run one cabinet uh, department in the government, you probably have a pretty good chance of being able to run just about any one of them. And I think he had that kind of leadership experience. And most importantly, and I'm sure you'd remember this, when something really bad happened, like a terrorist incident, the hijacking of an airliner, one of those TWA airliners mm -hmm. that got t hijacked in the Middle East yeah. somewhere, George P. Schultz afterwards would say, now this is you know, a priority issue for me, and we'll have a meeting on the terrorism question every morning in my office at 7 o'clock or 7.15 for a, you know, a period of weeks until he felt he had the issue under proper management and control within the Department of State. And I thought that was leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, he also, um, before he made a lot of trips to Moscow, mm -hmm. before he went to Moscow, he always had what he called a se uh, Saturday seminar. He'd pull academics in that knew something about the Soviet Union, historians and others. And he'd have this talk in the afternoon before he went there. So he, he was able to kind of bridge this, uh, this gap that some people think exist between academia and, and well, that, government. I think there's a good example yeah. of how his academic background uh, served him very well. And I did attend uh, at least yeah. one, if not more, of his seminars, because I remember going to one of his Saturday seminars mm -hmm. on Mexico. 
mm -hmm. subject in which I had a great deal of in interest when I was Deputy National Security Advisor and then subsequently became ambassador there. So I was able to witness mm -hmm. that personally. So let me, Richard mentioned controversy, challenges. I want to ask you about Honduras. It's a long time ago. A lot of controversy over Honduras, Central America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, the Contras, uh, Sandinistas. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, um, what interactions you had with the Secretary of State, with the President, and how you ran an embassy that was very diverse, where we had a considerable presence, and as I recall, a good deal of disagreement even within the Foreign Service Corps about what our pol what, how our policy was going. I remember there were Foreign Service officers that used the dissent channel in the State Department, for example, to register disagreement. So can you talk a little bit about that? That was a tough post, I know. That was my uh, first ambassadorship, mm -hmm. actually, to a country. I'd had the rank of ambassador for some fisheries negotiations that I'd done before that, but that was my first post, if you will, as an ambassador. I went down there in November of uh, 1981, which was during the Reagan administration. I'd actually hoped to go to Southeast Asia because I had been the Deputy Assistant Secretary for mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, but that didn't work out. That's a, a, a long story. So uh, I got called by Thomas Enders, the Assistant Secretary, one day and asked me if I'd like to go to Honduras. I said, sure, I want to, go. I want to have an ambassadorship. And actually, Mr. Reagan was a very, being the gracious man that he was, he used to call. Yes. Ambassador, desig ambassador nominees personally to offer them. Uh, I think the, the only posting. president that did that. Too. Yeah, I'd never got called by any other yeah, president I was called about by that. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe by President Bush because at, right. at that point I was at a much more senior level. But I happened to be traveling at the time. You know, I knew this was in the works, and the White House operator calls my home in Washington, and we'd been sort of on tenor hooks, were we going to get this job or not? And the White House operator called and said, is, Ambassador Negr is Mr. Negroponte there? And my wife said, no, he's in Manila. Uh, I was there on a, some kind of mission. And uh, they said, oh, well, we'll wait till he comes back. And my wife said, no, please, please, call him now. <laughs> she wanted to get this <laughs> waiting period over with. Anyway, the president, uh, the White House operator, tracked me down, and I was at a meeting with the, uh, the Filipino Secretary of Commerce. And boy, was he impressed. Uh, his secretary walked into the office and said, Mr. Negroponte, President Reagan is calling you. <laughs> that's the only time something like that had ever happened to me. And you were successful me. in the negotiation. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> right. He must have thought I had a lot of clout. Um, and he invited me to do that job. Anyway, a number of months later, I went down. Um, Honduras, at the time I got there, uh, had just uh, had elections. Or no, they'd just written a new constitution, and they were about to have elections for a president after a nine-year interval uh, of military rule. And about three weeks after uh, I got there, they had these presidential elections. And, uh, and I was there for the next three and a half uh, years. Uh, it was a very turbulent period because in Nicar basically the phrase I, I like to use was Honduras was surrounded by trouble. In Nicaragua, the Sandinistas had come to power about a year or two earlier. In El Salvador, there was basically a civil war going on. And in Guatemala, they had uh, the makings of a civil war as well. There was a lot of internal turmoil. And in fact, you had refugees from every one of these countries in Honduras. Honduras had a, a huge number of refugees from those other countries. So they were uh, in a very vulnerable position. Uh, as you mentioned, there was the Contra thing. I, I got there November 6th. November 19th, the president approved uh, one of these findings for covert action to arm some of the rebels inside of uh, Nicaragua, uh, uh, which I had not been advised of before I went down to Honduras. I, was, I learned about it after I got there. Uh, and that, what started out as a fairly small uh, sort of effort ended up uh, w with about, uh, you, as you said, a rather large embassy with a lar large number of CIA people and Mullet. probably three or four thousand people under arms at uh, mm -hmm. maybe more at, at its peak. So there was that going on. There were refugees, as I said. 
Uh, and we also established a close relationship with the Honduran military uh, and established an air base there. Uh, we negotiated an access agreement to an airfield there. And we uh, uh, stationed some US troops there, some six or 700, because we had limitations on how many people we could send to El Salvador. Um, there came a point at which uh, the Congress uh, took exception without going into all the details right. to the Contra business and uh, voted uh, an amendment called the Boland Amendment to which prohibited military assistance to, to these people. And quite unwisely, I think, thereafter, people within the president's administration uh, working around the embassy, around me, around everybody else, chose to illicitly support the Contras with funds from Saudi Arabia and uh, heaven knows where else. Uh, which uh, got revealed at one point and caused a great deal. This in 1987, I believe it was, uh, and put the administration through a period of real, uh, real tension and anxiety. But the president somehow survived the controversy. The whole contra program was completely uh, shut down. Now, so this is a question that often comes up in our classes. I'm yeah. sure it comes up at Yale as well. How do you deal with uh, how do you deal with dissent in a situation like that? There was seemed to be uh, there was uh, since this was coming in a kind of illegal operation with Ali North and and yeah. some of his cohorts uh, and but the policy was set support for the the Contras uh, opposition to the Sandinistas. Uh, I'm sure you had some ideas about this and yet as ambassador you were bound to carry out exactly what had been decided by the president. Yeah, well, there's some... And you, have a and you get a letter that says you're in charge of this yep. from and the it's president. It's a particularly complicated situation because, and here's the part for anybody who's going to be an ambassador, uh, the hardest part, is if Washington is divided about what to do, it really makes your job that much harder. If, mm -hmm. if you know there's serious division between the State Department and the White House, and there was, you mentioned there that. Was. If you know this serious division between the Congress and the White House, and you're supposedly representing the entirety of the United States of America in country X, Y, or Z, it's very hard when you don't feel you have a unified government uh, behind you. Now, I think one of the ways I dealt with it is I had a fairly clear idea of some things that were not controversial that I knew I wanted to get done. For example, at uh, support uh, a buildup in economic and military assistance to the government of Honduras for legitimate purposes, nothing to do with this Contra business or anything else. But Honduras was vulnerable. If the Nicaraguans, who had an army four or five times as large as uh, Honduras, ever decided to lash out at them, they were going to be very exposed. So I worked on trying to build their military up in a sensible way, but to build it up nonetheless, and also to get them more economic assistance, because they were very much under stress because of the refugees and all the turmoil in Central America that made Honduras not exactly the ideal investment destination. So you had that problem. Uh, luckily, Dr. Kissinger came down with a commission at one point during our time there, and uh, they decided to recommend to the government that we we increase our aid to Central America. And I think that was very, including a lot of scholarships from mm -hmm. Central American students. And, and uh, they got that program going. But how you deal with dissent, I mean, you, I think the best way is to have a reasonably clear idea of what you yourself want to get done, uh, work on that, and uh, try to deal with the rest of the issues as best you can as you go along. The general rule is a lot of talk, a lot of debate up to the point of decision. Yes. And after the point of decision, you either stand to and carry out but, the policy or but if do something the, else. If someone in Washington is right. circumventing the law, right. unbeknownst to uh, others or with a limited uh, universe, poses of people, somewhat of a problem. That makes it a little bit yeah. different. Yeah. No, anyway, true. you mentioned look, the best legacy of Honduras for me is I have five adopted Honduran children. Yeah. Good for you. And uh, they've been a source of tremendous joy to me and my family uh, all those years. Good for you. You mentioned Kissinger. 
Yes, I did. <laughs> you worked for Kissinger. I did. <laughs> so, talk about controversial. Yeah. I think in his older years now, I mean, he visited Brazil when I was there. He seemed to have mellowed somewhat, but he was a tough guy to work for. Can you, and a leader, can you talk about him a little bit? He, I don't best. think he's going to be watching live in any case. No, no, it's okay. He's a hard man to work for. He's very hard. He's a taskmaster, no question about it. And I knew him all the way back in Vietnam when I was a political officer in Saigon, and I was what they call a provincial reporter out of the political section of the embassy, and I covered the northern part of South Vietnam, uh, first core area for anybody who's a Vietnam vet uh, here. And... Uh, uh, Henry was a consultant for uh, Henry Cabot Lodge. He was a professor at Harvard, and he came out to, to advise the ambassador. And he came out uh, two successive years, I think 65 and 66, to advise, uh, or 64 and 65, uh, advise him on how his political observations and trying to help us figure out what, what to do in Vietnam. And he was uh, a lot of fun to take around, and we each uh, were a assigned to take him around a certain part of the country. So I knew him pretty well from his two trips uh, to Vietnam, where I had something to do with arranging uh, his different visits. And he was a highly uh, intelligent, articulate, quick, quick study, uh, wonderful guy. Uh, I, I then uh, was in the Paris peace talks, if you fast forward a few years mm -hmm. later, and uh, under LBJ, Averill Harriman and Cyrus Vance were uh, running the delegation, and Henry again was showing up from time to time to uh, be in touch with the delegation. And then, of course, uh, Nixon wins the election, and Henry becomes the national security advisor. And about a year later, I ended up working on the national, being recruited to work on the national security uh, council staff uh, in uh, well, a year, two, two, 1970. And uh, after a few months uh, in a sort of a obscure planning job, I ended up being put in charge of the Vietnam account on the National Security. I was the director for Vietnam in the National Security Council. So I accompanied him on every single one going forward from then of his secret negotiations with, with the Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese, to Paris and the different meetings we had. We would take... <laughs> secret trips here, there, everywhere. We would fly to, in Air Force One to Orléans, which was a mm -hmm. French Air Force base, and we'd take a small plane provided by President Pompidou, and it would fly us to a little military airfield outside of Paris, and then the defense attaché, you remember General Walters. Oh, remember of Walters course. He'd meet us in his trench coat like that at the airport. Polyglot spoke to play. 12 well, he languages was to play or something. Sort of, you know, Sam Spade kind of <laughs> thing. He gave us all aliases. It was General Kirschbaum. Winston Lord was Colonel Landry, and I was Lieutenant Newman. And the only thing common was we had the first letter of our last name. And we went and stayed with uh, Walters. We were, I don't know who we were fooling. I mean, the French Secret Service knew we were around, and the Vietnamese knew we were coming to meet them. So I'm not entirely certain uh, whom we were trying to fool. But he just loved that kind of thing. And well, the China secret the visit to China, China trip, too. Yeah. Um, but he was a real taskmaster. I guess the most uh, frequently heard story that people who worked for Kissinger will tell you is that if you walked into his office, you gave him a paper that you'd worked on, and he'd look at you and say, is this the best you can do, <laughs> without even reading it. And if you said no, he'd give it back to you and say, well, come back when it's the best that you could do. So people would dutifully go back and rewrite it. And sometimes he'd make you rewrite papers. Uh, I mean, I've had to write, rewrite a paper for him a dozen times. He was a real perfectionist. Students, keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> and he worked any hour of the day. Yeah. He would go out to a black tie dinner in Washington, go to a state dinner or the Kennedy Center or whatever it was, and then he'd come back at 11 or 12 at night and, and be working. And if he was working on something that you had responsibility for, he fully <laughs> expected you to be there. Is it true that he said power is the greatest aphrodisiac? Uh, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just curious, because he was dating. He dated Jill St. John. Yeah, I, I, right. I remember one of our one of my favorites. 
one of our uh, past Nobody will. peace negotiations. Some of you will remember, Jill We Singh. come back <laughs> the day that the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese present us their plan to end the war and restore peace in Vietnam, a draft proposal in October, October 8th of 1972. And Henry promises them a counter-proposal the next morning. We all go back to the embassy. We were staying at the embassy residence. He asks us, me, Winston, mm -hmm. Peter Rodman, David Engel, to write the counter-proposal. And he goes out on a date with Jill St. John. Here we are. The did he ask if that was, or did you ask him if that was the best he well, could no, do? Well, but we had to write it over again anyway, because <laughs> he didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> he thought it was too tough. So I have another question. Uh, this is, again, in the Reagan administration. I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Rights in the Reagan administration, which some people said is an oxymoron. You, that's not fair. You were assisted. That, that is not fair, but in any way, that's a, an impression. You were Assistant Secretary for Oceans, Environment, and Science. Yes, I was. Which also could have, you know, we, were, we didn't do the Law of the Sea Treaty. There was a, a whole kind of resistance within the Re Reagan administration to environmental things. So you were, you were, I think, in the job for a couple of years. Can you say I did it for two and a half years, and I had done it two and a half years previously as the deputy head of mm -hmm. that bureau to negotiating fishing agreements. And I guess the one thing I would say is that that was the time, 1987, when we negotiated, uh, for those of you who might be interested in international environmental issues, the Montreal Protocol to protect the stratospheric ozone layer, which uh, was the one major global greenhouse gas uh, emission agreement that has been achieved. Uh, there hasn't been another one since. And what I found interesting about that exercise, and I was involved because my deputy was the negotiator, Richard Benedict, and he wrote a book about it actually called Ozone Diplomacy. Um, and what was really interesting about it was the science advisor of the president didn't believe the science. Uh, there had been a Mexican chemi chemi chemist, I think, chemical, uh, uh, and a Raymond and Molina. Molina was the Mexican, and they'd successfully conducted an experiment that demonstrated that these chlorofluorocarbon molecules destroyed the ozone uh, layer. And the science advisor, the president, didn't believe it. The Russians didn't believe it. The Japanese didn't believe it. The Europeans had questions. Uh, we made an alliance. This shows you how Washington works. Uh, Mr. Schultz and Mr. Whitehead, we had a wonderful mm -hmm. deputy John Secretary Whitehead, yeah. of State, and a fellow who'd been the former head of Goldman Sachs. We made a league with the uh, head of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we mounted delegations, scientific delegations, from NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NSA, uh, NASA, the uh, National Aeronautic and Space Administration, people who study these kinds of things. And we sent them to Russia, we sent them to Japan, we sent them to Brussels. We convinced our scientific peers around the world, the ones that, you know, would have weight in any such international negotiation of the uh, merits of the science. Uh, and we basically negotiated this agreement and then we got into one of these sort of things that only can happen in Washington, you know, the gunfight at OK Corral, mm -hmm. the showdown in the interagency meeting and Mr. Schultz and Mr. Whitehead held their ground along with the head of the EPA and Mr. Schultz wrote to the president and said, I'm sending a delegation to, unless you object, to Montreal to sign this agreement uh, next week uh, unless you have objection and the president agreed. So, you know, uh, it's amazing how, it? you know, yeah. who would have thought and Don yeah. Hodel and uh, the Interior Secretary, who was against it, he said, well, you just, you know, it's not really a problem, just use more sun cream. That's what he said. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Let's move on to Mexico. Yes, sir. You had an interesting period there. NAFTA was being negotiated, I guess, at the time. Not yet. Not yet, not but at least it was got there, yeah. early stages, yeah. right? Um, you have three countries, uh, three leaders, president, uh, Prime Minister of Canada, President of Mexico. Um, 
Give us some observations about how, you know, this is still controversial. It's an interesting thing. People still well, are talking I, about why are we letting those yeah. Mexican trucks come yeah. all the way up here? Right. So well, give us some insights into that. that. It's quadrupled the trade between the two countries and been a fundamentally beneficial to the United States. But how about then? But then, when uh, I went down there, was the summer of uh, 89, and you have to go into 1990 because nothing much happened in that mm -hmm. first year. And our trade, the trade relationship with Mexico was uh, modest. And our, uh, we didn't have any kind of free trade ar arrangement. We've been discussing sector by sector uh, liberalization of trade. But, you know, when you think about it, sector by sector liberalization means that you, you pick the exceptions and liberalize them, and then the rule is still to have the old protections in place. But a seminal thing happened, and I, I think really it, 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 it goes back to the end of the Cold War, the fact that the Cold War uh, was ending, mm -hmm. Eastern Europe was uh, liberated, wall went, down. Yep. wall went down, and so Carlos Salinas, the then president of Mexico, a PhD political economist from Harvard, uh, goes to Michigan, the world, Michigan of the East. The yes. Michigan of the East, yes, indeed. And uh, the, the, he goes to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, in uh, January of 1990, and he meets all these European, Eastern European leaders uh, who are competing like crazy to get investment from the West to help. Uh, modernize and revive their economies, and Mr. Salinas concluded, my goodness, competition for the savings of Western countries has all of a sudden become a lot stiffer than it used to be, and I've got to do something to make the Mexican economy more attractive. And so he's the one who proposed a free trade agreement with the United States, and uh, I went up uh, his chief of staff sounded me out in March of that year. I went up to Washington. I had an appointment to see President Bush, on whom I, uh, with whom I was on very friendly terms. And I had a meeting with him and Secretary Baker and just one other person. And we walked him, talked him through the pros and cons of having a NAFTA mm -hmm. in a one-hour meeting. And he said, yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, and at first, it was just going to be bilateral because Mr. Baker had just been through the process of negotiating a free trade agreement with Canada a couple right. of years earlier, and he hadn't enjoyed the, there were some aspects of the negotiations that he hadn't found as enjoyable as he might have liked. But uh, when the Canadians got you know, wind of the fact that we were gonna do a free trade agreement, Mr. Mulroney basically got on an airplane and went to Kennebunkport, Maine, and persuaded Mr. Bush that it had to be trilateral because and he told him very bluntly, he said, look, otherwise you're going to leave a, you're going to be in the cockpit, you're going to have a bilateral with us and a bilateral with uh, Mexico, and you're going to be able to, you'll be in the driver's seat. We all ought to be in this together. So we did a trilateral and uh, started negotiations, and by the end of uh, 1992, we, we completed the talks and signed the agreement in San Antonio uh, after Mr. Bush had been de defeated for re-election. And then we all held our breath when Mr. Clinton came to office and wondered what was going to happen. And he appointed Mickey Cantor to be the head, mm -hmm. the free trade the trade uh, rep. And he came down and met the Mexicans and said, we're going to have to do two additional agreements on environmental and labor Maybe, conditions yeah. before we, we go for, through with this. And, and I groaned, and everybody else who'd worked for three years on this deal Groaned, but we actually, believe it or not, got that in August of '93. And uh, you may recall this: Bush, uh, Clinton, and Gore ended up fighting harder yeah. for the NAFTA than I think uh, George Bush might have done. I mean, you remember the Gore um, Ross Perot debate, which was all about the NAFTA, mm -hmm. and which the was great a, sucking, sound which uh, was an itself. incredible argument uh, on TV. And then Mr. Clinton really went to bat for the NAFTA uh, in Congress, and it it, it, it went through. So uh, it had strong bilateral, uh, by uh, you know, bipartisan uh, support, and uh, it was quite an experience. We, you've had such a long career. We have to. 
excise some of the stops along the way. Let me just say one thing about Mexico because okay. it was sure. controversial. Mexico, the, you've always got the good, the bad, and the ugly, and uh, in, in that relationship. There's a movie by that name. Yeah, right. But I mean, it's a little bit like that because, for example, the drug trafficking issues, yeah. the violence. Right. I had an issue that just sort of uh, kind of haunted the relationship uh, the entire time I was there, and that was, you may remember Dr. Alvarez Machine. Oh, was, yeah, sure. He was the medical doctor, Mexican doctor, who kept... Kiki Camarena. Yeah. Agent, DEA agent Camarena alive. With a, a, some of you may remember the Mexicans captured a DEA agent, drug traffickers did, tortured. and tortured him to get information about what he knew about uh, their, what they were doing, their trade and their practices. And they used Dr. Alvarez Machine to torture, to uh, help keep him alive while they were torturing him so they could get more information. And so a couple of years, a few years later, that was in 85, and when, when I got there, some bounty hunters mm -hmm. came down from uh, the States and snatched Mr. Alvarez. On their own initiative. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, snatched him from his medical office in Guadalajara, and lo and behold, a few months later, he was before a court uh, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there was a huge Supreme Court case on whether or not someone who had been detained or captured under such circumstances could rightfully be brought before an American court. And believe it or not, the Supreme Court upheld the government, said it was okay. Uh, and they drew on some precedents that went back to the 19th century when we'd had a lot of there were bounty hunting was activity. A, there was a, a lot more. Bolivia and a Peru cases. I well, yeah, and there were Canadian cases. Yeah, yeah. There were a lot of Canadian right. cases in those days. You better beware. I mean, you're near there. You know, you're not too far away. <laughs> uh, uh, so th that was when the Mexicans went into an uproar. I mean, I had demonstrations in front of my embassies for the next several days because of that decision. But the worst of it was they yes. then went to try him, and he was dismissed for lack, lack of, of evidence. sufficient yeah. evidence. And I said, my God, you know, how can we make such a thing out of this and then not have enough evidence to even snatch him? I thought that was one of the worst showings of America, of our, uh, you know, our prosecutorial system. It did uphold the doctrine. Seen. It upheld the doctrine, but didn't <laughs> win the case. Now, that's really, it uh, didn't win the specific case That's against him. But that was a real albatross, and we had yeah. to deal with it all the time. Yeah. I'd like to jump ahead to the, to the UN. We want to open this up yeah, for we're questions out pretty out soon, but I want, I want you to talk yeah, a bit about the UN. It's hard to do 44 years in, in I know, but anyway, in talk, half an hour. UN. So you leave the Foreign Service. Yeah. You went to McGraw-Hill. Right. Uh, as vice president, executive vice president, as I recall, for international affairs. And then you come back as, I guess, a, a political appointee. Is that correct? To, and are nominated or sent to the UN as ambassador, confirmed by the Senate. So I remember Senator Moynihan, some of you will remember Senator Moynihan, very, he wrote a book in which he called the UN a dangerous place, mainly because of this Zionism is racism uh, resolution. But can you talk about your experience? Yeah. You, you were there when actually uh, we tried to get this uh, resolution through on Iraq. The second resolution. The second resolution to authorize the United States to use military well, and let me, its let allies. Me say, Go ahead. First of all, it's a fascinating mm -hmm. place. Uh, I don't think it's dangerous. Uh, Moynihan did a great job. He got rid of I mean, he successfully, we successfully defeated the Zionism as racism mm. uh, resolution. But I don't know whether we did it during his No, we did it actually did, during Clinton. Okay. Moynihan was very good, though, because he would drink everybody under the table in the afternoon yeah. and negotiate with them at the same but, time. But so the Russian, mean, with Russian respect for the late right? senator, he basically he used great. it as a platform for his candidacy to become a senator, right? Well, so I'm about, I believe he was only there six months. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that that's a uh, particularly long tenure. But in any case... Uh, it's a fascinating place. It gets a bum rap in the United States, basically. I mean, I think the United Nations uh, can be a very useful uh, tool in our toolkit. Uh, uh, Security Council resolutions are binding on the entire membership of uh, the United Nations. 
And actually, I got there six, seven days after 9-11, and within two weeks, we, the first mm -hmm. resolution we negotiated after I got there was a resolution uh, that turned out to be extremely useful. It was a template for how to deal with terrorism financing. It was basically a draft law that every, it was like an appendix to a Security mm -hmm. Council resolution that every member country could use as a template for its own terrorist financing. There was a lot of good stuff we did. Even on Iraq, I would say, most of what we did uh, was quite constructive, including getting the first, the, the inspections of Iraq renewed, 1441. We put a huge amount of effort into that. The difficulty in Iraq, with respect to Iraq, was that the administration had really, and it's much clearer, it became much clearer to me in retrospect than it was at the time, had really decided to invade Iraq anyway. And uh, so this UN was kind of a distraction. I think the president was willing to give it a chance, uh, but only if it produced results very quickly. Tony Blair put some pressure yeah, on it. Yeah, I mean, well, Tony Blair, I mean, the British didn't do us a favor. They, they told the president, you have to have a second resolution. We got this first resolution that sets up the inspection system, but says Iraq is in material mm -hmm. breach. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the onus is on them to prove that they're not in material mm -hmm. breach of its international obligations. And so we were ready to go without a second resolution just based on the fact that they weren't cooperating with the inspectors. But Blair said his attorney general insisted that there be a second resolution, otherwise he wouldn't be able to accompany us. And the irony of it is that by seeking a second resolution, we lost the French. The French had been telling us exactly the opposite. They were saying, don't Whatever you do, don't try to get a second resolution. If you do something with just the first one, they were intimating that they might be able to live with that. So we followed Blair's advice, and the French then threatened to veto, so the whole thing was over. And then the British accompanied us anyway, even though we didn't have a second resolution. So it was a little bit of a, a mess. So and, tell uh, me how... But, but you know... Uh, yeah, you win a few, you Tell lose Tell me, so I think you've said that you thought it was not a good decision to invade Iraq. I thought it was too soon. I yeah. felt that we went through enormous... How do you effort. handle that at the UN when you're pushing for, pushing for this? I, we we uh, put a huge amount of effort into getting the first resolution, setting up the inspection. 1441 was, a, I mean, an enormous effort. And we got a unanimous resolution. Even the Syrians came along with us. At the last minute, I remember they called me as I was walking down to the Security Council to cast uh, my vote. Uh, and that was in, like, late November. Uh, and to be making war preparations then in January, February, I thought was a little bit premature. Any Anybody who's going to set up an international inspection system and an elaborate UN process knows it's going to take a number of months to begin to be able to see whether you're going to get results or not. I would have thought, I think they were worried about the, that the hot season was coming. It was going to get very hot in Iraq in the summer and the troops were already moving out there. As I said, they were really ready to go yeah. So then they told us to get the sec try to get the second resolution. We couldn't get it, even with that. You remember the famous uh, appearance by General Powell with me and uh, infamous, I would say. infamous, mm -hmm. uh, and George Tenet sitting behind him, and he was trying to persuade everybody, in good faith, I should add, at the time that that Iraq had WMD, um, and. Uh, then the president invaded, uh, he ordered the invasion in uh, at the middle of March, mm -hmm. March 18th. So how do you deal with that in what way? I mean, I'm, I'm the ambassador of the United Nations. I'm not, uh, I wasn't even a cabinet member. There were some UN ambassadors or cabinet mm -hmm. members, so I didn't even attend the meetings in the Situation Room that dealt with these kinds of decisions. This was the old, the slam dunk. Thing. Correct. The tenant said it's a slam dunk that they have WMD. Well, he was wrong. He was wrong. 
he wrong? He, and they over-relied on one source who turned out to be basically an Iraqi who wanted us to invade Iraq. Mm -hmm. and therefore, Curveball. Yeah. Therefore fed us false yeah. information. And it's in fact the, the occurrence that led eventually to the creation of uh, one of my future jobs as Director of National Intelligence. So then you go to Iraq as ambassador. I go. I volunteered to go. Right after Jerry Brim, or right after that, when the occupation is going to be ended, I volunteered to go because I said I'm a senior diplomat. I've been in this business for uh, uh, well more than 40 years, really, mm -hmm. when you added it all up. And uh, I'd had some experience in Vietnam that had taught me, I thought, some good lessons about how civilian and military efforts should co collaborate together. I felt I could. Uh, whether you agree with the decision or not, you can make the implementation, you know, there's such thing as good implementation and bad implementation. And I thought I could contribute to the better implementation of our policy in Iraq by volunteering to go out there. Okay. The president then invited me down for an interview. And yes, 20 minutes, he offered me the job. I, I want you to just say a few words about um, so you were a cabinet member eventually because you became the director of national intelligence, rank, first yeah. one, cabinet yeah. rank, yeah. The, which was a, a recommendation by the 9-11 commission and by the WMD, a variety, WMD yeah. committee. Uh, and so you had to start from scratch in putting this together. It's now, I would say, a relatively viable enterprise. Right. General Clapper has been there for how long? Three years? Well, three and a half. You, you weren't there that long? And then you Not were long enough. Deputy Secretary of State. Yeah, I didn't spend enough time there. How about, how about a, a, a minute's worth of, or two minutes' worth of <laughs> description? Can you do that in two of minutes? Of the DNI? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was it, basically, it was the I know you can do this. side the beltway part of the intelligence function. I mean, it was plans, budget, policy, analysis. It was not an operational job running operations or entities uh, uh, outside the country or anything else. It was a sort of an oversight uh, function, but, but accompanied by the title and a very important function, in my view, of being the principal intelligence advisor to the of the president. And as a result of which, by law, as a result of which I was at all his intelligence briefings and he was very interested in intelligence, and he got them six days a week, every Monday through Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning. And those always turned out to be extremely interesting sessions with the President of the United States. Do you know if this has continued under President Obama? It has, to my understanding, maybe sometimes with a little, not quite the same clockwork uh, regularity, but yes. But it's institutional. It does. Yes, it does. Okay. And, and, and Mr. Clapper well, has access to it. We could spend hours on this. Well, uh, the one but, point I'd make okay. about intelligence is intelligence needs to, intelligence is a tool, mm -hmm. not a panacea. And intelligence is not just collection. A lot of people think of intelligence as James Bond and daring do uh, efforts to collect uh, information by breaking into people's offices. Intelligence is the collection and analysis right. of information for the purposes of statecraft. And as far as I was concerned, it's the analytic function where we frequently go wrong, where we don't see the trend, we don't see the truth that's staring us in the face. It's not whether we failed to collect this or that. Okay. So, uh, as I say, we could go on for a long time. We have questions. Whoops. Let's see. Yep. Okay. How, so you're going to pose the questions? You've picked some of these out? We're going to read some of the questions that the okay. audience has given. All right. Go ahead. So, my name is Amanda. I'm a first year master's student here. So on behalf of the students, we just want to thank you for taking some time thank to you. answer some of the questions from the audience. The first question is, given your experience in the government, what do you think the U.S. response should be to the situation in Ukraine, given the U.S. leadership vacuum in the wake of McFaul's resignation. His resignation coincides with pro-Russian protests in the Crimea, military activity in Russia, and Russia's acceptance of Yanukovych's request for asylum. Do you think McFaul's resignation empowers Russia to interfere in Ukraine? Whose re resignation? Oh, the Yanukovych. Yanukovych. Yeah. McFaul's, re McFaul's resignation. Oh, for McFaul's resignation. Yeah, I'm not sure I know what 
uh, relationship that has to do with uh, Ukraine. But the basic question is, what should we do about Ukraine? Is it not? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, McFall's leaving anyway. Yeah. yeah. Here's uh, what I think. Uh, I think it was in the spring of 2008 that there was the Bucharest NATO summit that uh, mentioned the possibility of Georgia and the Ukraine right. uh, becoming members of NATO. And I think that we pushed the envelope just a bit too far in terms of expanding our uh, radius of uh, Western influence into what the Russians referred to as their near abroad. It was one thing to do it in the 1990s when Russia was uh, weaker, and we sort of got a, some of these things got accomplished, luckily for them, I think, and for us, like the Baltic states uh, and uh, uh, the Central European countries. But I think that given the fact that Russia was back on the ascendancy, their economy had quadrupled, quintupled in size from its uh, nadir, Putin's filling his oats, uh, they've, uh, it's not only the increasing price of oil, it's the doubling of uh, production of oil and so forth. Uh, and I think that that uh, Russian invasion of Georgia in the summer, in August of 2008, was really the signal that you're going this far and no further. That's the way I interpreted what the Russians did. And so I think they're for them, the question of the fate of Ukraine is a very neuralgic mm -hmm. um, issue, particularly since their historic ties and everything else. And frankly, I don't know where this seesaw is going to end, because when I saw Yanukovych uh, flee and new government take over in Kyiv, and now the Russians conducting exercise in uh, so, yeah. uh, near the border of uh, eastern Ukraine. I think it's kind of a very uh, potentially explosive mix there, and uh, I think we need to be. I think we need to deal with this in a low key way. I don't think we should crow about uh, the success of a pro-Western uh, government getting. Uh, into office in Kyiv, and I think we should uh, encourage some sort of reconciliation between these diverse elements uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine in whatever best way we can. But without being too interventionist, maybe letting the Europeans take something of the lead. Then you've got the other question about, well, who's going to pony up the money for this financially distressed economy, and uh, that's another question we're going to have to deal with as well. Hi, my name is Seema Singh. I'm a master's student at the Ford School, and I'm asking more audience questions. Um, in retrospect, was it a good idea to arm Shiite militias in Iraq in service of the so-called Salvador option? Can Iraq be considered a success when there continues to be persecution of religious minorities and a lower standard of living than under Saddam Hussein's rule? Well, I've never been much of a fan of arming militias. I think it's contrary to the concept of trying to build national institutions. And certainly while I was there, my uh, desire was to build the army uh, and the uh, uh, police forces, but in the hope uh, that they would become truly national institutions. Uh, I'm not aware that we ever armed Shia militias. I think there was a Shia militia under the rule of, uh, under the command of Muqtada al-Sadr, but he, uh, in fact, we fought against him for a while. There was, a, when I got there, there was a rebellion in Najaf and there was a rebellion in Sadr city and on the edge of uh, Baghdad, uh, which was ultimately brought under some kind of control. What, well, the groups that we did arm were the Sunni militias out in the western part of the country in El Anbar to help fight Al-Qaeda. And that met with a modicum of success. But still, it's not a good long-term, I mean, I don't think militias are ever a good long-term solution. Would I consider Iraq a success? Um, well, I, 
We said earlier, I, I'm not sure I would have gone in uh, when we did. So I think there, I, and I, I'm not sure we went in in the right way when we finally did go in. Uh, I think it's hard to, to judge where it's going to turn out. We might, I think there's a, a somewhat of a chance we might be pleasantly uh, surprised. Uh, but at the moment, they're going through a difficult patch. Will they fall back into complete disarray? I don't think so. I think that the, the, the institutions of the state are, are really quite large and substantial, and I think my, my guess, and it's only a guess, would be that they'll hold together. But they're surrounded now by an awful lot of turmoil. I mean, Syria, mm -hmm. Egypt, so on and so forth. All right, the next question is, do you think the military has taken over U.S. foreign policy? If so, is this due solely to budget size, and how can it be reversed? What was the last part of the question? Due to budget size. So, is it solely due to budget size, and how can it be reversed? Yeah. Well, you know, if you go to war someplace, and you're in uh, uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, and you have a military command with 50 or 100,000 troops there, there's no way that they're not going to have influence on the policy towards that country. I mean, uh, it's, it's a wartime situation. But uh, I think in most places, I think our military is quite uh, respectful of uh, civilian uh, political leadership. And uh, it's basically a, a shared uh, responsibility. But in most places you go around the world, uh, you visit a country where there's an embassy, it will be the ambassador uh, uh, who has responsibility for all the elements, as Ambassador Levitsky was saying, of the country team, who's really the principal spokesperson and the principal local representative of our policies. I think uh, during this period, of uh, the decade of 2002 to 2000, well, to, to the present, there's probably been a disproportionate uh, military role, but that's sort of receding back into uh, a little better perspective, it seems to me. And uh, the other elements of national power are coming more to the fore. So some, one thing the sequesters seem to have pushed forward. Yeah. You know, um, the other Secretary thing, Gates actually was quite uh, open about saying there should be more of financing for the State Department and and for the Defense Department to get out of so-called nation building. It was something for state to do. And in fact, he established a fund when Secretary Clinton was there to kind of put together a sort of stabilization, reconstruction uh, unit that could um, provide mostly civilian aid to so countries. So this goes to a more fundamental issue. My Now I've got, you know, I guess I can make some generalizations after having first entered the Foreign Service in 1960. I don't think we're too good at nation building. I really no. don't. I don't think we do that part very well, and I don't think we're very good at regime change. Um, and I don't think our experience has been particularly salutary. The the overthrow of Xiem in Vietnam. What did that lead us to? The overthrow of uh, Samosa of the Shah. You may not like the way they led their countries, but almost in, invariably. <laughs> <laughs> the situation got worse after uh, these things were done. The overthrow of Saddam. So uh, sometimes you have to be a little careful what you wish for, it seems to me. And, and, and you also have to maybe have a little bit of strategic patience. Uh, democracy isn't going to be built overnight. We have a lot of important alliances around the world. I think those are the the institutions that we should really support, our alliances with NATO, with Japan, with Korea, with Australia, and the Philippines, Thailand. And those are the relationships we should nurture in the first instance, and then hope, perhaps by our example, that these concepts take hold in other parts of the world. And if you look, I mean, the news is actually quite encouraging in some parts of the world. If you look at Africa, the degree of uh, democratic governance uh, today, compared to 50 years ago, or when they f first got their independence, a lot of these colonial countries, or Latin America, when uh, I first joined the Foreign Service, practically every country was a dictatorship. Yeah, right. And today, 
the, the dictatorships are the exception to the rule. And if you look at what happened in Eastern Europe at the end of the Cold War, it's not because of us that they became de democratic, it's because of themselves. So I think sometimes we shouldn't be too hasty to substitute our own uh, desire to be active <laughs> for uh, allowing uh, maybe uh, the roots of uh, good governance to take hold in, in the countries themselves. So I wish we'd adopt a bit more of a, while being interested in the world and caring about maintaining major institutions such as the Bretton Woods system, a free trade system. Trade's very important, but uh, maybe a little bit more laid back when it comes to telling other people how to run their political business. This it's is the finger pointing yeah. part of our diplomacy that, that gives me pause. This is the hardest thing for us to do, I think. Oh, it's very to lay hard. back. It's very it's just hard. <laughs> not in our con not the, our constitution, our inward constitution. Yeah. We tend to be activists. Well, I'll, I'll, Ambassador Boucher is going to be here a couple of more months. He can uh, explain to you how he he was told to finger point so often when he got That's up right. on the press dais in in the State Department about commenting on every which thing that was happening in different right. countries. Expected. Mm -hmm. There were many covert, covert torture centers in Iraq during your ambassadorship. Covert what? Um, torture centers during your ambassadorship. Is torture okay? What no. Makes, <laughs> under, <laughs> I under certain to interject. circumstances, what makes torture of accused terrorists different compared to the tor capture and torture of our own troops and agents? No, and uh, I think that's a very good point, and that's probably the best darned reason uh, why, uh, well, first of all, torture doesn't work. Uh, and secondly, uh, if you want your troops to be treated properly under the Geneva Convention, you better treat other people likewise. There was a, we had a seminal sort of point in the Vietnam War where at first we didn't want to treat the Viet Cong uh, as uh, combatants uh, because, uh, because we didn't want to be bound by the laws of war in the way we dealt with mm -hmm. the Viet Cong. But our Pentagon jumped into that argument very rapidly to say, look, I mean, what, we got to think about our people. We had 2,000, in the end of the war, we had 2,200 people who were prisoners. So wait a minute. The uh, first part of this question said there were torture centers in Iraq. No. That's right. No, there weren't. Great. Before I got there, and it got shut down, and it was a great humiliation and embarrassment for the United States, and it was totally repudiated by our government. It was not authorized behavior. It was outrageous. I'm not saying it wasn't outrageous, but it certainly wasn't sanctioned behavior. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um. it doesn't work, and you don't want it done to our people, and that's not a bad place to start. And yeah. So there are a number of questions about um, Central America, so we're just going to read one. Um, what lessons can we learn for U.S. foreign policy today from the era in which you served in Central America, which has largely been characterized by the violent and covert overthrow of dem democratically elected governments? Are these practices still necessary for U.S. foreign policy today? Well, I guess if you tried to date the last and somebody's going to correct me, but uh, the last overthrow of a Central American government, it was the overthrow of the Guatemalan government in 1954, our Benz, when I was uh, a high school uh, student. It's not been a feature of, of our government since. They've become progressively more democratic. Uh, look. Central America was a very interesting combination of circumstances. Uh, poverty, uh, large differences between rich and poor, uh, social injustice, overlaid by Cold War competition, where you, uh, which aggravated the situation and which was exploited uh, by the uh, protagonists, if you will. I find it very interesting that really these conflicts ended up being much more amenable to solution 
as the Cold War came to an end. Gorbachev made a decision in the mid-1980s to no longer support uh, wars of na national liberation, and by uh, 1990, uh, a Democratic candidate was able to defeat the Sandinistas at a poll in a, in a free election, something we didn't believe was going to be possible. So I think once you take the Cold War dimension out of it, the Central American issues became more manageable. The Salvador War ended. Also, when I was ambassador to Mexico, we signed the, the, the peace accords of Chapultepec in Mexico. But, and, and it was a very moving moment to watch the Salvadoran rebels and the Salvadoran president walking out into the middle of the room, embracing each other, ha having not ever even met before to end uh, this war. Now, what's disappointing about what's happened since is that uh, in a lot of these countries now, the, the violence of the civil wars and tensions of the past has now been substituted by these gangs, these criminal gangs in Central America. And Honduras has got gangs that are a number two or three times the size of the army. And that's a huge uh, social problem. And it's a big problem in El Salvador and Guatemala. It's also as been well. a problem for us because and many it leads to crime. Many of the, many of the gangs are from deported from Los uh, Angeles. From, from Los Angeles, yeah. yes, indeed. Yeah. It's uh, so that's it continues to be a tragic situation. It's it, and it's an area where I think Mexico and the United States could cooperate with each other. Mexico borders right on these countries. They have a they have a national security stake in the situation in Central America if only because these people migrate through mm -hmm. and violate their border constantly to come up and uh, immigrate into the United States. And because, you know, it, it just figures. Any country has an interest in having a stable and prosperous neighbor. So to the extent that we, together, can work with the Central American countries to help improve their livelihood and their economic situation, that would be to the good. And the last point I'd make in that regard is that Mr. Bush, I think, uh, George W. had a good idea in negotiating this Central American Free Trade Agreement with the United States, but we've never quite been able to take advantage of it as much as we ought to. There ought to be more American investment going down there to take advantage of the free trade terms that we negotiated with them. I don't know why it hasn't happened. Maybe the uh, last question? I mean, it's great. Do you have another one? Do you run out of questions? No, no. I don't think so. <laughs> Mel will think, think of so. something. <laughs> I think of something. Um, the question states, I believe most Americans today would say U.S. intervention in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, as finally conducted, were not, within the, were, were not worth the price and lives and money. How can leaders make it more likely the United States will say no when strong intervention will cause more harm than good? And what can citizens do to get such leaders? Yeah. Well, I can't, I can't argue with your basic proposition, because any time you send U.S. forces somewhere and you don't have a desired outcome, people rightfully say, well, why did we do it uh, in the first place? How do we avoid doing it uh, in the future? Well, first of all, let's remember that the Cold War is over. That's one point. So I think that reduces the likelihood. Um, I think we have to be smarter in how we cope with some of these uh, issues in terms of responding to uh, terrorism. I don't think it's automatically followed that because the uh, attack against uh, the World Trade Center was staged or planned in Afghanistan that you had to end up with 100,000 troops there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that necessarily follows. So, you know, we have to think these things through um, uh, more carefully. I think the political tolerance in this country for this kind of deployment or expedition is probably uh, much lower than it's ever been. Now, there's a wonderful line. I teach, uh, I co-teach a course on strategy at Yale with several uh, diplomatic historians, among them uh, John Lewis Gaddis, who's a great mm -hmm. Cold War historian, and we, we, we start out by reading all the classics. And Sun Tzu, the Chinese 
strategist who only wrote a hundred pages or something, starts out, you know, war uh, is a very serious, this is a sort of a paraphrase, but war is a very serious matter, uh, a matter of life and death. It must be considered very seriously. And you know, if you just remember that opening line of Sun Tzu, uh, you might avoid uh, some mistakes. Uh, but we'll see, we'll see what happens in the future. It's still a dangerous world out there. We still have to work with other countries to try to help, help maintain peace and security around the world. I think one other answer would be use the United Nations more. Some of these peacekeeping operations in the UN have turned out to be actually quite successful. Sierra Leone was pacified by UN peacekeepers. Liberia, peace was restored there. Sometimes we give, as I said earlier, the UN a bum rap, and we could probably use them better, to better effect, more efficiently. And so we could spread that risk a little bit so we don't immediately get embroiled in political controversy over whether we should have undertaken some kind of a unilateral action. And I guess that would be my last point. James A. Baker was successful as a diplomat because he got a consensus resolution through the United Nations Security Council for us to go into the first Persian Gulf War. We had unanimity, the Russians, the Chinese, the Arab countries, everybody. And that makes a big difference. We went into Iraq without the legitimating imprimatur of a Security Council resolution. So it seems to me if you're going to contemplate these kinds of activities, go in there accompanied by others. And ideally, by the international community as a whole. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank the audience. A wonderful session. Wow. Do you remember what? Your victims. Oh, my victims. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your victims. I don't know what they're talking about.